So a very good day to one and all. I am Dr. Rohit Gopinath and today we will be discussing about thyroid which is one of the largest endocrine glands in the body. Now thyroid, the topic thyroid remains a very important topic from an undergraduate perspective because we expect a lot of questions to come in both your theory as well as in practicals with relation to thyroid. In practicals, thyroid swellings can be kept as a long case or as a short case and a large number of theory short notes and questions MCQs can come from this topic. And from a surgeon's perspective, we do encounter a large number of patients with thyroid anomalies. So, without further ado, let us get back into this topic. Now, before we discuss regarding the various pathologies that afflict our inflict the thyroid gland, it is very important that we have a basic understanding regarding the development of the thyroid gland. So, the thyroid, which is like I said earlier, which is the largest uh, endocrine glands in the body, develops from the floor of the developing pharynx. It forms from what is called as the foramen cecum. From the foramen cecum, there arises a median downgrowth of cells. It is initially solid and then it recanalizes to form what is called as the thyroglossal duct. This thyroglossal duct descends down and as it descends down, it is pushed anteriorly and little bit towards the left by the developing hyoid bone. The lower end of the thyroglossal duct becomes bifid and each limb of it forms one of the lobes of the thyroid gland. You find that the thyroid gland as such has certain specialized cells called parafollicular C cells. So these parafollicular C cells are of neural crest origin and they develop from the ultimobranchial body. Uh, with a basic understanding regarding how a thyroid gland develops, now let's go on to the surgical anatomy of the thyroid gland. So anatomy as far as thyroid is concerned is of great importance from a surgical perspective. Without a proper understanding of the anatomy of the thyroid and its surrounding associations, it is difficult to operate on a patient with a thyroid swelling. So the thyroid gland as we all know, the word thyroid is derived from the Greek word for a shield. So it is a butterfly shaped organ which is located anterior to the thyroid cartilage and the tracheal rings. In fact, in fact, it extends from the mid portion of the thyroid cartilage or the notch of the thyroid cartilage right up till the sixth tracheal ring. So you find that both the thyroid has two lobes, it has a right lobe and a left lobe and they are connected together by the isthmus. So the lobes of the thyroid gland generally are generally around 5 by 3 by 1.5 centimeters in size and the isthmus is generally around 1.5 by 1.5 centimeters. The gland itself might have an approximate weight of around 20 grams. So you find that this isthmus which is present connecting the two lobes of the thyroid gland might sometimes be absent in around 10% cases or it might be just a fibrotic band. So the isthmus of a thyroid gland is located or it's present over the second to fourth tracheal rings. So if you want to assess the extent of the thyroid gland based on the vertebral level, it extends from C5 to T1 vertebral level. Now. The thyroid gland itself is covered over by a true capsule and a false capsule, similar to what you encounter with the prostate. So the true capsule of the thyroid gland is formed by condensed connective tissue, whereas the false capsule of the thyroid gland is formed by the is formed by the pretracheal fascia, which itself is a part of the deep cervical fascia. So this pretracheal part of the deep cervical fascia condenses posterior, encases the thyroid gland and condenses posteriorly to form the Berry's ligament. This Berry's ligament becomes bifid and inserts itself into the cricoid cartilage. One of the reasons why the thyroid gland moves with deglutition. In its attachment, you find that there are certain, there is a certain landmark in the thyroid gland which is very important to identify the recurrent laryngeal nerve. On the posterior aspect of the thyroid gland, we have what is called as the tubercle of Zucker candle. So this tubercle of Zucker candle is a landmark used to identify the superior parathyroid gland and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So this is an important structure which is usually looked for to preserve the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So with the basic understanding regarding the extent of the gland and how you find how it is attached to the underlying trachea, we can go on trachea as well as to the uh, laryngeal cartilages. Let us now go on to assess what are the relations of the thyroid gland. 
So you find that both the lobes of the thyroid gland are medially related to the trachea and the esophagus. So basically, it is in close approximation with the tracheoesophageal groove. Tracheoesophageal groove has a very important nerve within it in this region called the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So medially, the lateral lobes of the thyroid gland are related to the trachea, esophagus and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Laterally, it is related to the vagus nerve, the IJV as well as the common carotid artery. And posteriorly, posterolaterally to be more precise, you have it being related to the inferior thyroid artery, vertebral vein and the vertebral artery. So superiorly or suprolaterally, you have it being covered by the strap muscles, namely the sternothyroid and the sternohyoid. The lateral borders or the lateral uh, lobes of the thyroid plant might sometimes be covered over by the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle as well. So understanding of these relations is important like I said earlier when you are planning for a surgery of a thyroid gland. So this picture here demonstrates what I had already mentioned earlier regarding how a thyroid gland has a true and a false capsule. Now why is it important to know that the thyroid gland has a true or false and a false capsule? It is because surgical dissection in thyroidectomy is always between the true and the false capsule. That is, you go deep to the pretracheal fascia, but you remain superficial to the connective tissue over it. So that is the avascular plane where you have to go into dissection, which is different from that of a prostate. In a prostate, the venous plexus is located between the true and the false capsule, so your dissection should be outside the false capsule. Whereas in the thyroid gland, the dissection is between the false capsule and the true capsule. Now, if you take a cross section of the thyroid gland, stain it adequately and look at it under a microscope, you get to, you get to see what are called as follicles or acinus. So the basic functioning unit of a thyroid gland is a follicle or a acinus. So these follicles are composed of follicular cells as well as a follicular cavity. So these cells here are the follicular cells and this is the follicular cavity. Now the follicular cells have a unique property by which that their epithelium varies or the cells vary depending upon what state of activity the gland is in. For example, if the gland is inactive, these cells remain to be squamous in nature. If the cell is acting normally, the activity is normal, then these cells tend to be cuboidal in nature. If there is an overactivity of the gland, then the cells become columnar in nature. So the cells, these, uh, the type of cell that is encountered depends upon the activity within the thyroid gland. And the hormones which are produced by these cells or follicular cells get stored within the follicular cavity as colloid. In between the follicles, you have a lot of connective tissue. You have blood capillaries as well as specialized cells called parafollicular C cells. So these parafollicular C cells are responsible for the secretion of calcitonin. <music>